In this video, I'm going to be talking about the clinical manifestations of herpes simplex virus infections, and my specific learning objectives are to describe the clinical presentation of HSV infections, both in normal hosts and in immunocompromised hosts. First, some generalities about HSV infections. They cause a multitude of clinical syndromes, clinical illnesses. In general, HSV type 1 causes infections above the belt, and HSV2 infections below the belt, and I'll explain that in detail in a moment. The infections are often silent. That is, you may not see any clinical signs of infection, but the infected individual is shedding virus and potentially infecting others. With regards to primary versus recurrent infections. Recall that primary infections are the first time a patient has experienced the infection. Recurrent is when it's occurring time and time again. This table contrasts primary from recurrent infections. In general, primary infections, when they are associated with symptoms, the illness tends to be very severe, whereas recurrent infections, not so, uh, quite mild usually. In primary infections, there tends to be a lot of virus shed from secretions. In recurrent infections, a little uh, virus is shed. In primary infections, virus is shed from multiple locations. For example, if it's a genital infection in a woman, it may be shed from the vagina, from the cervix, from the perirectal area, and so forth. Whereas with recurrent infections, the virus is shed from a small area. The number of days of shedding is long. Uh, five or six days with a primary infection, or maybe longer. With recurrent infection, shedding may be only for one or two days. With primary infection, there are, by definition, there is no antibody present, whereas with recurrent infection, there is antibody present, and it is the presence or absence of antibody that's responsible for the differences between the primary and recurrent infections. HSV-1 infections, the types are listed on this slide. Gingivostomatitis, that is oral infections, uh, in its reactivated form, referred to as cold sores. Eye infections, skin infections, often referred to as Whitlow, or herpes encephalitis. And on this picture, you can see the oral infections, the eye infections, the skin infection at the fingertip, and herpes encephalitis. In contrast, HSV-2 infections occurring below the belt are responsible for genital infections, and when a, a mom is infected, a pregnant mom is infected, the possibility of congenital or perinatal, meaning around the time of delivery, infection. Going into a little bit more detail about each, HSV-1 gingivostomatitis is an infection occurring typically in a one to three year old, and when it is associated with symptoms and signs can be quite severe. The child may have a high fever, be miserable and irritable, have tender lymph nodes under the chin, may have extensive oral and cutaneous lesions, because of the lesions and the pain of the lesions, doesn't want to drink or eat, gets dehydrated. And this illness may evolve over several days, four or five, and it may take one or two weeks to heal. After that infection, the virus becomes latent in the trigeminal ganglia and from time to time may reactivate a recurrent herpes infection referred to as herpes labialis, which tends to be quite mild. Cold sores or fever blisters is a terminology. There are a few group vesicles on the lip, such as shown uh, in this uh, picture or perhaps in other areas around the mouth. The patient does not feel particularly sick. And there are a number of precipitating factors that uh, cause the infection to erupt in some individuals uh, more than others, sun and stress and so forth. Cutaneous infections with herpes, again, usually caused by type 1. The top picture shows an example of herpetic whitlow on the finger of an infected individual. The bottom picture shows an example of extensive herpes on the face of a young child with eczema, so it's called eczema herpeticum. Other types of skin infections caused by herpes, herpes gladiatorum, which can occur in wrestlers, especially on the bicep of a susceptible individual who's got the mouth of an infected individual wrapped in his bicep. And scrum pox are skin infections occurring in rugby players uh, acquired presumably in the scrums.
Herpes type 1 infections also can cause eye involvement with a follicular conjunctivitis or potential progression to corneal involvement. With corneal involvement, there may be ulcers that form. They're called dendritic ulcers, and they look something like this on the cornea. Recurrences of herpes in the eye can be sight-threatening, and therefore they're important to recognize and to treat. The most severe infection caused by herpes type 1 is herpes encephalitis. This is the most common sporadic form of encephalitis. Patients present with fever, headaches, and an altered state of consciousness. They may have seizures or other focal findings. Uh, the infection often involves the temporal lobe, as shown on this MRI, which is responsible for the focal signs. The, the patient may have focal abnormalities on their electroencephalogram, uh, reflecting either clinical or subclinical seizures. If you perform a spinal tap and, and get cerebral spinal fluid, there are often red cells and white cells present, a high protein concentration because of uh, destruction of brain tissue, and a PCR, looking for herpes DNA, will be positive at least after the process has been present for several days. Brain biopsies used to be used to diagnose the infection definitively, but because PCR is now so sensitive and specific, it's the diagnostic test of choice. This is a bad infection to have if it is not recognized and treated with antiviral therapy. About three quarters of patients will die. The uh, pathology specimen shows severe hemorrhagic encephalitis on the underside of the temporal lobe. Herpes genitalis is usually caused by herpes type 2, although there are increasing incidents of type 1 infection causing herpes genitalis as well, and that's uh, primarily because of oral sex. The infections are sexually transmitted. They're associated with the typical vesicular lesion, as shown uh, on the glands of this penis, which are associated with substantial local discomfort. Lesions may appear in other parts of the genital area below the waist, and patients may have associated prodromal symptoms such as pain, irritation, fever, and so forth. Systemic symptoms, that, that, those that I've just described, are quite common with primary infections the first time you're infected, but with recurrent infections, they tend not to be as common. An important uh, note is that on any given day, if a person is infected with genital herpes or has been infected with genital herpes, on any given day, there's about a 1% chance that they may be shedding virus from their genital tract even in the absence of signs or symptoms. And that's why herpes spreads readily amongst adult populations and is called the silent epidemic of sexually transmitted diseases. The first infection with, or, or most infections caused by herpes, even the first infection, are, are without symptoms. The person doesn't even know they've been infected. However, when associated with symptoms, primary infections tend to be much more severe than recurrent infections. Primary infections are especially severe in women when compared to men, and the picture is to exemplify that severity with a woman with genital lesions so severe that she needed to be catheterized to release her urine uh, from her bladder. Now, in this picture, our schematic of the relationship between microbiology and immunology, I want to underscore how important the immune system is, and if the immune system is compromised, such as the ways listed on this slide, herpes infections may be very severe. Compromise in a newborn whose immune system generally is not as robust as an older individual. Compromise by different kinds of immunodeficiencies that are either congenital or acquired, such as AIDS. Compromise by immunosuppressive therapy being used to treat an inflammatory disease, such as rheumatoid arthritis or lupus. Compromise by a bone marrow transplant or compromise because the barriers have been damaged with uh, abnormal skin, such as an eczema or in a burn. In patients who have compromised immunity, herpes infections tend to be more often recurrent. When they occur, they are more prolonged in nature. They are more progressive and destructive, causing local tissue damage, and they're more often disseminated. And herpes viruses especially like to disseminate to the liver, 
to the lungs, to the esophagus, and to the brain.